Hello, it's Duncan. Having finally installed our SQL repository class last episode, albeit with a flat file as our source of truth, we start this episode checking our structured logs to make sure that things are working as we predicted. Finding that they are, we need to add the ability to delete items from stock. We'd like to prototype the user interface quickly, so we resort to the age-old technique of running the app in the debugger and hot reloading our code and the browser until we have something that looks and works well enough to commit to an acceptance test. In the last episode, we finally got around to installing our dual items repository. This is the one that reads and writes from both our tab separated file and the Postgres database. And we said that we'd push that to production, but we'd carefully monitor things to check that it was working as we expected. Having tested it locally, what we expected to happen was that after we installed it, every request to list the stock would result in an error, or at least logging an error, because the database wasn't populated. And that would happen until the stock list was updated by the first request of a new day. And at that point, we expected the items to be saved both to the tab separated file and the database. And after that, they should stay in sync. So let's have a look at our logs and see what actually happened. I've pulled the relevant events out into this file and you can see I've grouped them. Here are some requests after we've installed the change. These are the first requests of the next day. And this is the first request of the day after that. Mm -hmm. So let's see what's going on here. And as we predicted, we're getting a stock list loading mismatch. And what that's saying is that we expected a stock list full of stuff, but what we actually got was an empty stock list. And that's because there's nothing in our Postgres table. And the same is true for all these events. The first event of the next day though, we see a stock list loading mismatch but then we see the event for the fetch of the root. After that, we're getting a slow HTTP event. And I think that's because writing everything to the database has taken a little bit of time. Finally, the next request, we're getting a request for root and we're not getting any of our mismatches. And then going on to the next morning, again, we're getting a successful request and we're not getting any mismatches. And we haven't seen any mismatches after that. So that's excellent. Things seem to be working as we expected, and we have a populated Postgres database. So now that Postgres is being populated, can we just get rid of the tab separated file? Well, unfortunately not. And the reason is that the feature we're actually working on wasn't just to work from Postgres. It was to allow us to add and remove items from the stock list. At the moment, Alison can edit the file by hand, but she can't do that in Postgres. So we're going to have to implement add and remove items before we can do the contract phase of our expand contract refactoring. This also reminds us that if she does edit the raw file, then we would expect what we read from disk to be out of sync with the Postgres data. And it will stay out of sync until the next morning. That's a bit irritating, but I'm not sure it's worth doing anything about right now if we can hurry up and implement add and remove items. So let's crack on. I think the delete will probably be the easiest thing to do next. And as this is gonna require changes to the user interface, we we'll want to be as interactive as we can to be productive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up our test main in the debugger. So if I'm test main and I'm going to debug that. Now it's started up, let's go and check that it's working as we expect. So we'll open the URL and then we have our stock list with, as we can see, some quite out of date data. Let's put that over to one side. and maybe zoom out a bit so we can see what we have. Okay, what I think I want to do is have a selection column, a selection of tick boxes, and then a button that allows you to delete the selected items. Where is it we render? Well, we have a handlebars file somewhere. Let me remember, it's uh, here, this stock list view model. So I should be able to add a column for selection. Maybe it doesn't need a title and a column in here that will have a checkbox in it. And a checkbox is an input type equals checkbox. 
Now we have HTTP 4K set to hot reload templates. So I think if we go over to Firefox and reload, we should see that change. Good. Now how about a button? Well, we'll get the graphic designs in later. So for now, let's just give ourselves an input type equals submit. And I think that wants to say delete. And if we save that and refresh that, we see our button. Now to link the submit and the checkboxes together, we'll need a form and that'll need to go around everything. So we'll add a form in here. And the back end of that will be the other end of the table. So there. I guess reformat will, oh well, do something like that. And now we need to decide where the form will submit to and it needs a method which in this case will be post. And we need to give it a URL, which I think is the action bit, which is a path on our server. So where should we submit the data to? Our root is listing the stock. So I think maybe we'll have a delete items path on our server. So again, we can save that, go over here, refresh, and nothing seems to change. Let's see what happens when we select some items and press delete. Well, nothing happened over there. Did we get anything here? All the way down here, we see we got a request to delete items. It was a post, but we don't have a handler for that, so nothing has happened. Well, I say nothing has happened. Actually, we sent a 404 for not found, and the browser has just ignored that. Okay, so we now need to put some handler at delete items. We have some routes. And there are currently two of them. One is for the listing and one is a deliberate error so we can test our error handling. So let's just add another one. And we said we were going to say delete items. And we know that we're going to be doing post to that. Now we don't want to send an error. Let's instead send an okay. So response with okay. That response and this is going to be status okay. And in here, we have a request. Well, I'm going to give ourselves a variable for that so that we can put a breakpoint here and see what's posted. Now let's see whether we hit that breakpoint if we go back here and press our delete button again. Well, we didn't hit the breakpoint and we didn't send an okay. And the reason is because these routes are set up when the app is first run. So we haven't actually set up a new route. That's a bit of a pain, so let's restart the server. and refresh the browser, resending that request. And here now we have hit the breakpoint and we can look at our request. Now we might expect to see some form data. So let's evaluate an expression, which is Alt F8. And we're going to say request.form. See whether you have one of those. And that's empty. So it turns out we're not submitting any form data. Why is that? Well. In our form, we have checkboxes, but they don't have any data associated with them. So we need to differentiate them. And that paradoxically, I think, is the name property. So if we put the ID of each one of our items into the name, save that. Now we need to let the server run back on again. So I'm going to resume that. Go back here, go back, press delete, and then evaluate request.form. You can see we have a list of the IDs of the checkboxes that were selected. Excellent. In fact, now we had this route installed, we can edit the code for the handler in place. So we can get rid of that and we can say, in here, we can say println request.form. And now we can take the date breakpoint out, resume. And if we submit here and look in the console, nothing happens because we actually have to build. So that's command F9, I think. And if we build that, now IntelliJ gives us the option to reload those classes. So if we reload that, 
and then resubmit. Now we see our output. So now we can experiment with our processing in here. We don't really want request.form, we want request.form map it first, which is a string, and then we want to map those into our item ID. ID of item on it. Import item, import ID, build, reload, refresh. And there's our list of IDs. Now the Firefox is sitting on a blank page because we've only sent an OK, we haven't sent any data. What should we send? Well, we could render the page. Instead of sending back the data, the usual pattern here is to send back a redirect. So in fact, we send status see other, and that requires a header. I think the header's name is location, and we want to send you back to the root. If we build that and reload, come back here, and now if we send this delete, the server extracts the IDs from it, and you see we have a new page here because the selection went away, and when we're finished, the items will have gone away. Right then, between hot reloading in the debugger and hot reloading of our templates, we've worked out how this is going to work from the outside. Now we can go and start writing some tests. I've stopped our test main, so let's go and run all our unit tests. Now they're failing, why is that? Ah, it's because we've changed the template for our listing stock to include the button and the checkboxes. Now we don't want to show those in production until we finish this feature, and we have feature flags to allow us to do that. So let's go to this view model, and what we'd like to do is only render this checkbox and this button when we have this feature enabled. The form, I think, can stay there because we don't have any inputs to it. It's innocuous. It won't change the rendering. I can't remember how to do an if in handlebars, but somewhere in our git history, we will have had if pricing is enabled. Let's take a line like that and put it into here like that for now. And then we want to do the same thing for this column and the column in the body. So we want to take that into there. Now, in fact, I think we probably shouldn't have stopped our test main, so let's run that again. We'll have a look to check that those things aren't shown by refreshing. Oh, that's not good. What happened? Some issue in our template. We found something expected end of file. Let's have a look in our template. Ah, we needed two squiggles at the beginning of these lines and another one there. If I save that hot reload should work. Back to Firefox, reload. And there we are unencumbered by our delete. This though doesn't want to be called is pricing enabled. It wants to be called is deleting enabled. And now we can go to our rendering which is in stockless rendering. And now we can see what would happen if we had a flag that was is deleting enabled. We'll make that true. Add the Boolean. And now if we rebuild this and reload, unfortunately it seems that we can't make that change. So we will restart the debug session and check that if we load in Firefox, then we now see our delete UI. Okay, we're getting there. We just want to solidify all that in tests. And so what I think I'm going to do is to take the default off of that, which will mean that this doesn't work. And now we want to populate that from our features. Features I think is up here somewhere. Ah, oh, we don't pass it into here anymore. So let's do that first of all. We can get this features of type features. And we can go off and see that. And that's currently empty. We'll make it a data class, I think makes more sense. And this can have val is deleting enabled, which is a Boolean. 
And we want to default that to false unless we say otherwise. Back to stock list rendering. We can use that features in here to add is deleting enabled is features is deleting enabled. And now if we try and build the list handler will tell us that we need to add the features into here. We don't have one of those create a parameter. Try and build again. And now we can pass the features into here. And that makes our features not an unused parameter anymore. Okay, just build now. Almost because in our stock list rendering tests, we need to tell it whether it needs to show the delete UI or not. So for this test, I think we're going to say features is a features where is deleting enabled is false. And the same thing in here. We could just use a default, but it's probably better to be explicit. Hello, it's editing Duncan here. It looks like recording Duncan has lost a bit. The test shouldn't be able to pass at this point because they're approvals tests and there's a form tag that wasn't there before. So if they're passing, I'm pretty sure there must have been a failure, an approval, and then a rerun so that they're now passing. But now let's write another test for our rendering with deleting enabled. So we take this test, duplicate it, list doc with deleting enabled. The change in that is here becomes true. And if we run all those, then we now have this test failing because we don't have an approved file. It's this one here. And that you can see has our table column with the checkboxes and a submit button. So that's what we want. We can go back here and wherever that is, we can approve it. Add that to Git, run everything again. And we now have tests for our rendering. That looks like a good place to check in. Let's see what's changed. Quite a bit, actually. We've got the new file that shows what the UI looks like. We've got changes to a couple of approved files because of knock-on effects or they won't be visible. We've added the feature in feature. Listing has changed, are again because of the features. And we had this little bit of code in roots to define a delete items route. We, you know, we could take that out, but I don't think it's doing any harm and it's the code that we're about to use. So I think we'll commit it. And this is going to be render checkboxes and delete button in list page. Commit that. Splendid. So now we know our user interface, so we can get on with implementing it. And we're going to do that from the outside in. So we're going to start with acceptance level test and then write the code to make that pass. At the moment, we have one acceptance test, really. That's this list stock tests. And it's been left in a little bit of a state after our last refactor, the one that introduced dependency injection. But you can see down here that basically we start an app. And in this case, we do operations two ways. We ask the app to load the stock list and check that it is the stock list we expect. And also we hit the roots on the app and then approve the returned HTML. These HTTP requests are all in memory and we're using in-memory items here as well. These are really nice fast tests. We don't have any Selenium tests, anything that actually starts up a browser. We may have to get to that later, but at the moment we're relatively confident in what we have. As we're probably going to copy a lot of the structure of list stock tests for our new test, I think maybe we should tidy it up first. First thing is that we had this context of IO on our tests, but we learned before that we could move that up into here and say context of IO. Oh, and the order is wrong. The compiler really doesn't work properly there. So now let's go and see if we can move that and that one and run all tests. It's still happy with that. So that's a little bit tighter. Now in report errors, we have this items that fails, which is a mock effectively that returns a failure when we try and list the stock list. We had a way of doing that was a little bit shorter. We could say this was items by fake. And this fake uses Java proxies to implement an interface for us. So given that, we can get rid of this one here, I think, which would tighten everything up a bit. See whether that's true. And it is good. 
And then a tiny thing, as item loading fails, I suspect we don't need any pricing in here. So this could just throw not implemented error, because I don't think we'll ever call it. Check that's true. And it is good. Okay, so this reports errors is reasonably standalone. Let's fold it away and have a look at our other test, the list stock. So that populates an in-memory items, then saves a stock list in that in-memory items, runs up an app with it, and checks that the app returns a priced version of that. Seems to be a little bit of jiggery-pokery here where we say pricing maps to value of pricing, but we seem to be getting things in and out of here. I think that was because we were using an HTTP server. But I think we could tidy this up by going to value of pricing here and saying that instead of taking an ID and a quality, this could just take an item because it's both part of an item. So we could say this is item, get rid of that. And then that would allow us to test not when ID, but when item is either stock list 0, 1, or two like that. And then this could be value of pricing given item. Is that true? Yes, it is. Good. Looking back up here, we seem to jump around. We've got a stock list that's composed of items and then the pricing references the stock list and then the expected price stock list references the stock list as well. I wonder whether it wouldn't be better if we started off with a list of priced items. So in fact, instead of saying stock list with items here, we could say this was stock list with the last modified and then these items. And then we could move that up into here and use these items. So put those in there, something like that. What have we got? We've got a comma too many normally, so get rid of that, that. Now all that data should still be the same as it was. Let's check by running. And it is. And now we can take this stock list and say its items are the expected price stock list dot map, where every item goes to the item with price of null. So we remove the prices here rather than adding them in the other place. Is that true? Yes, it is. And now instead of having this when here in this pricing, I think we could say, go to the expected price stock list, find it equals item. So that will give us a nullable thing. And if we have one, we can just return its price. Although, although that's a result. So in fact, we need to get the value or null out of that. And here, instead of having an unexpected item for pricing, we'll just return null. So we can go back up here, get rid of that. And I think that's the same thing. But it turns out the tests don't agree with me. And thinking about it, I realized that the it's in our expected price stock list will have a price. So in fact, we need to remove it in order to check it against our item that doesn't have a price. So we've got to put with price null in there. A bit tedious, but it is the truth. Now, why am I doing this? Well, I'm looking for an abstraction that feels like I might use it in another test. So I'm going to sketch that out now. I think it's going to say class fixture, and I want to give that a price stock list and an implementation of items. So it's going to have priced stock list, which is a stock list, and I think for now, I'll have it create an in-memory items itself. So let's say we created one of those in here. Say fixture is a fixture given my expected price stock list. Now, first of all, can I ask the fixture for its items? So in here, we'd say this is fixture.items. Well, in order to have that, we'd have a items in here. And I think we'll make that in-memory items for now. And we can take this code here and put that in there. So if I now delete this one and make this the price stock list, but that will already have the pricing. So we want this version here in there now. So we take this and move it down into our fixture. 
So take that, put that in there. And now does that pass our tests? It does good. But this parameter here should end up in there. Good. And now we'd like to be able to go to our fixture and ask the fixture for pricing as well. So we'll say fixture dot pricing. And I'm going to take that and remember it. So we'll create a property in our fixture. And in fact, it would be better if this is a function, I think. So we say that's fixture pricing. And so this will be fun pricing. And what do we know about pricing? Well, it's a thing that takes an item and returns a price question mark. How can we do that in our fixture? Well, we can do this thing. Looks like we need a comma in there. And now we have an issue that pricing is a function that requires IO. So we had a context of IO. Well, we can fix that quite easily here just by saying this is context of IO. Now our value of pricing is not required and we should be able to pass the tests. Splendid. We're still cheating a bit because this is purple and therefore taken from up here. But that is again just the same as our constructor parameter there, although we need to make it into a property. And I think it might as well be public. And I think this might as well be a data class. A little bit of formatting. Another question is, can we take this out of here and move it out of the class altogether and run? It looks like we were still relying on last modified, but that will be the last modified of our priced stock list. So this is price stock list last modified, which in fact makes this price stock list copy those items. Is that true? Still good. So now let's have a look at the top of that test. Now I think we can remove our companion object and as it's only used in this test, we can inline that. So now we're building a fixture on a stock list with some prices in it. Then we can build an app asking the fixture for the items without the price. Maybe we should call that unpriced items. And we can now take our fixture class out and use it for other integration tests. So we'll take this and we'll move it out into its own class. Run everything. And I think that would be a good place to check in. So this is extract fixture from list stock tests. And there's one warning apparently, let's go and check that. Missing associated label in our view model, but I don't think we'd have a label for an unlabeled checkbox. So we can ignore that. Okay. And now as it's staring me in the face, I notice that we have this stock list written twice. That was silly of me. I think it must have been part of the inline. So we'll pull this and we'll say this is a variable of price stock list. And now we can tighten that back up. Tighten up that. Run the tests. And amend commit that little fix. Good. And now it's quite neat. We're in a position to take our list stock tests and duplicate that as delete item tests. Let's add that and see what we need to do. So instead of having list stock, we will have delete items. And I don't think we need this report there as a tool. So let's just delete that for now. We go through the same sort of setup as before. We create a stock list. We create an app. I don't think we need to load, but what we can do is we can say we want to post to delete items. Now we don't need to approve anything about that for now. So we get rid of that, but we do want a form which we can create here. Now that form is going to have the ID of one of our items. So we'll say price stock list zero id to string and i seem to remember we had the string on for the checkboxes that were checked 
and we need to import an extension function for form. That's only one item. I suppose we should probably delete two. So let's just reformat this so we can add some bits into it. Go here, duplicate that, and we'll delete the last item as well. This is our response. We know that we need to see other in there. So I think we can say assert that response has header. Let's just go and check what we put in our roots. We had our location. So it was a status C other header location. In fact, I think we could say that that's the response we expect. So we could say assert equals is our response. Now, given that we've already put some code in our roots, I think there's a chance that might actually work. Let's find out. Oh, not quite. What's the failure? Ah, some tracing headers put in by HTTP4K. Now they're non-deterministic, so I suppose that we will have to go and say assert that response has status the other and has header location. Import and and that's all good. There's only one thing missing, which is that we need to have deleted the items. So we should also say that assert equals a stock list with last modified and a list of just the remaining item, which is price stock list one, but with no price, is what happens when we ask the fixture to load the stock list now, do we expect this to pass? Well, the answer is no, because we haven't actually put any code in to delete anything. So let's check that's true by running the tests. They have failed. Let's see why. And there we have it that they have failed because there are three items as opposed to the only one that there will be when we've implemented that code. Well, we've quite a bit of work ahead of us, but with a failing test to remind us what that is, that seems like a good place to stop for the day. I could check this in with this test being disabled, but I think I'll just leave it here on my machine so that we can pick up in the next episode. Before we finish, let's just review what we've covered today. First of all, it was important to check that our last change worked because of the risk it wouldn't work as we expected in production. Instead of just looking at the logs, we hypothesized what we should see, and then we checked that that was the case. We prototyped our user interface using hot reloaded templates on the server, classes in the debugger, and pages in the browser to give us fast feedback. We then used feature flags to hide our work in progress and acceptance tests to lock down our UI. We refactored our existing acceptance test to make the code more reusable and then reused it in the new acceptance test for the new feature. And as we didn't complete the work on the feature in a single sitting, we left a failing test to remind us what we're working on when we come back. If you'd like a reminder when we start work on that, then please subscribe to the channel. And if you've enjoyed this, then I think you'll enjoy the book that I wrote with that price called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.